Hi, it's uh, Craig and Brad with Prolec here. And we're going to try something a little bit different today for a video. And we're going to talk about base layers and try and present it as kind of a buying guide and give you a state of the market report. Mm -hmm. And uh, see if you guys like these type of videos. If you do like it, we can do some additional ones. Um, so if you like this type of video concept, uh, give us a thumbs up or subscribe or share or just watch the video and, and we'll be able to tell whether these type of videos are uh, resonating with our customers and uh, audience. Um, so let's talk about base layers. You know, performance base layers oftentimes are something that a customer may not give as much uh, thought to or pay enough attention to. But really, they're pretty critical when you are, you know, in a high exertion backcountry activity, oh, yeah. just in terms of uh, moisture management. Um, and if I look back, you know, Pro Light Gear is 10 years old. If I look back to when we started this business 10 years ago, um, that was right when Merino wool was coming on to the market as a base layer option. And I felt it was a kind of a game changer in terms of what other options were available. Well, especially for the odor control. I mean, back then it was just straight polyester and you put it on it stunk like crazy. Right. Merino you could wear for a week solid. Yeah, that was the one, one of yeah. the really big selling points of Merino at the time was, was odor control. And so we really put a lot of our uh, uh, marketing efforts and dollars behind Merino. Um, you know, 10 years later there's been some new uh, new technology that's come yep. into the market, uh, combinations of things. So we're going to go over all of that. Um, and I'm going to try and simplify this as much of, as possible to keep the uh, time of the video relatively short. So we're going to talk about pure synthetic options, pure merino options, and then hybrids between the two. Mm -hmm. um, and so starting off with the uh, pure merino side of things, uh, you know, a great solution. I, I still wear quite a bit of, of Pure Merino. There are some downsides to a Pure Merino solution. Yep. You know, we're probably going to get into a little bit of trouble with some of the Pure Merino brands. Um, but, you know, we test all this stuff. I want to show you, you know, we affectionately refer to, to this guy as Mr. Steamy. And it's, it's one of the inventions I kind of created here. Um, what I do is, uh, this is a hollow uh, mannequin body. But I've drilled some holes you know, in the chest area, I don't know if you can see this on video or not, Shane, but underneath the arm area, just in um, the areas where the body does, you know, produce a lot of moisture, a lot of perspiration. And I hook this up to a commercial steamer. And what this does is it just allows us to accelerate uh, the wetting out process so we can and do it in a repeatable fashion so that we can observe how different uh, base layers you know, perform with wicking, mm -hmm. and then how quickly they dry out. We also use this to test different combinations of base layers with mid layers and outer layers, you know, and, and visually see how things change with ambient air temperature changes, differences in relative humidity, etc. So, um, yeah, we do test this, and of course we do field testing on this. Um, so the criteria that we're going to look at uh, for evaluation criteria are wicking performance, uh, dry time performance, odor control, durability, thermal regulation, fire resistance, and cost. And some of those are more important than others. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, 10 years ago when we first started uh, really seeing Merino wool, we were probably one of the first companies to really jump on it and uh, brought an icebreaker from New Zealand at, at the time. Uh, great in terms of odor control, you know, pretty good in terms of wicking. You know, not so good in the dry times yeah. once it's wet. That's one of the uh, uh, the negatives, I guess, that Brad and I both feel is associated with Merino. It doesn't wick as fast as some other options, and it doesn't dry as fast. Durability is a kind of a negative. Depending on the weight. The 260 weights wear like iron. The 200 weights wear decently well. When you get down to the 150 weights, you really start noticing a lot of pilling very quickly and the garment lasting far shorter. It also depends components. too, Brad, if you're wearing you know, your base layer as a t-shirt <clears throat> or like on the boxer or the brief side of things. Oh, I've yeah. had really uh, limited durability with the, with the boxers and the yeah. briefs. I think it's a higher abrasion, higher wear area. Yep. Um, so, uh, but uh, Merino wool uh, also was fire resistant. That may or may not be 
Um, Military and forest fires. Yeah. Forest fire fires. I mean, I think it's really a big deal for them. But it won't support an open flame, but, uh, you know, we put a video up 10 years ago. You know, it's not Nomex. It's yeah. not fire It'll still burn. Yeah, it will still burn. Um, cost is one of the major issues with Merino relative to a pure synthetic option. You're looking probably at least twice as much money oh, yeah, for... I mean, there's a finite number of sheep in the world. And with right. more and more brands getting into Merino wool and adding... The ten, the twelve, the five percent's there just to say if their garment has merino wool in it. It's dividing that pie a little bit more, and so the pures. We'll talk about that in the hybrid side things because yeah. there's some uh, stuff that might be misleading on the marketing front. Just to use the buzzword merino in there. Um, what we're seeing on the merino front is a lot of different brands brought a merino-based solution to market. Um, Frankly, from our opinion, you know, the, the different brands, the different marketers try and differentiate their product as much as they can, but really there wasn't a lot of difference from my perspective yeah. as, as a consumer and as a dealer for these. Um, and there was even a brand called, Mich uh, well, IOBio, which was owned by a parent company out of Australia called Michelle, which controls about 70% of the Merino, yeah. the global Merino market, and, you know, they... Great bunch of people behind that company, but they struggle to ever get mind share or market share in the U.S. Uh, they are still around, but they don't sell through dealers anymore, and they ship out of Canada, I believe. Yep, Is that for, the, for North America. And they are direct-to-consumer only uh, model in North America. Great product. Oh, wow. um, you know, of course, we think of Icebreaker when we think of Merino. Smart Wool. Smart Wool and Patagonia. Yep. Probably the three leaders, but like I said, there's lots of different brands out there. Um, they'll try and differentiate based on the diameter of the fiber they use, uh, you know, 18 micron, etc. But the reality is, well, and the reality is that the highest quality of merino fibers go to the fashion industry. We're talking, you know, Milan, Italy. Oh, yeah. And let's say you were talking about, what brand was it that got the waistbands out of? Iobio Bio got it from Armani for the men's boxers. Right. Their boxers yeah. were awesome. I have to... Did that, yeah, I mean, the waistband was beautiful, and the boxers were very well constructed. I mean, they basically made Armani's boxers for them and just relabeled them for the outdoor industry. Yeah, but, you know, the, the, the fashion industry, because they charge a premium for their product, they kind of get first dibs. Oh, they get all the high-graded bales, for sure. Well, now, but Icebreaker kind of went vertical and started to put a lot of the suppliers under contract, and they make a, a special... Um, Distinction that they're using New Zealand-based merino wool, but have they outrun? I mean, it's the global demand for merino such that there's not enough coming out of New Zealand, and so yeah. I mean, bulk of merino is now coming out of Australia. It is okay. Yep. All right. Um, so in terms of the uh, pure merino plays, um, even you know Icebreaker, who probably likes to market around pure merino more than anybody else, and some of their uh, higher performance, they'll use some. Um, um, synthetics in there, like 2 to 3%, just to help give the garment some shape. Yeah, I mean, they, they know this because once you wet out merino wool, it bags out, it gets very, very heavy, it doesn't hold right. good shape. So they put that elastane in there just to keep it snug fitting and tight so it doesn't bag out on you. And elastane is just the generic name for lycra. So if you're more familiar with lycra. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to talk on the merino front? I think it's still a viable option. Um, I think you know, where we're going with this is we think there's a better option out there than pure merino. Pure Merino for me is a non-winter item. I know it's supposed to be very thermal efficient, but in the winter I sweat so much that I wet this stuff out and it never dries. On your trips, I was wet for days and days and all I brought was Pure Merino. It, for me, will make sense in very, very hot climates like desert where you want something that gets wet and doesn't like to dry quickly because it helps the evaporative cooling. You just raised a real interesting point. I think a lot of people may think base layer think strictly late fall, winter. Oh, it's yeah, actually no. year-round you know, yeah, thermal I mean, regulation. If I'm going down to the Grand Canyon or a desert area and it's summer, I wear a long sleeve, either like light gray, 200 weight wool that I just get soaking wet before I put it on. And that really helps me get cool. Or even if rafting in the summer, if I know I'm not going to be you know, getting out of the boat very often, I just dunk a long sleeve shirt and put it on. And that really helps me stay cool. Whereas a synthetic would do the opposite. It would dry too fast and I would get too hot. I, I still use a lot of just pure merino because I have a lot of it still left yeah. over. And I don't sweat as much as Brad does, so I'm not King as sweating. concerned about uh, wicking and dry time yeah. as, as you are. Um, but, you know, if I was buying 
new product or replacement product for my pure merino stuff, I would I would go a slightly different route, and we'll talk about that later. So, do you want to move on to the pure synthetics because yeah. this is where I think we're hitting another um, pretty big technology you know adoption cycle in the market mm -hmm. with polygene. Yep. And uh, why don't you talk quickly about polygene? Talk about the history of trying to treat pure synthetics, um, and then you know, where we're at with polygene today. So, synthetics have always been plagued with odor problems. Um, you can try washing the older ones in vinegar, things like that, that help knock down the bacteria that actually cause the scent. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not your own oil, it's your own oils and stuff that the little bacteria are feeding on. And just putting them in the washing machine with just detergent doesn't quite kill them all the way, it just kind of puts them into hibernation. Um, people have tried lots of different things. I know Patagonia used Gladiator for a long time, which lasted about 12 washes before the garment just stunk the second you put it back on again. Other companies tried weaving little bits of silver thread into the garment, which silver pretty much doesn't let any kind of bacteria or fungal stuff grow on it, which is, works great, but only on that little thread. And polygene is just incredible. I've used it over and over and over again and continually impressed with it. It's something that doesn't wash out of the fabric because it's permanently embedded in. It's actually a silver salt that creates the active ion that goes on to the polyester or the nylon, whatever part of it. And you can wear this stuff over and over and it doesn't stink. Yeah, we've had great success with it so far. Um, you've got a Rad Eon T there. Yeah, I mean, the reason we have this out, it's one of the best selling like pure synthetics in our shop. It is super lightweight. But Polygene is being used by, geez, a large number of very well-known brands. Oh, it came if from you, the medical industry. Yeah, in, in yeah. Europe, it's approved for uh, direct placement on open wounds. And Which so, is really neat. Yeah, so it's it's got a ton of history, a lot of scientific validation behind it. And it works. Yeah, and it does work. Um, so, you know how like in the computer industry, how uh, they brand Intel Insights, so you might be buying a Dell or a Hewlett Packard computer, but yep. if they'll have that sticker on there that says Intel Inside. The sporting goods industry, you know, Gore-Tex kind of took the lead with that, with, you know, having the hang tags that say Gore-Tex. Oh, yeah. so I think you're going to, if you haven't already heard of Polygene, I predict you're going to hear a lot more about it. Um, it makes these wearable for days and days in the backcountry. I mean, it makes me want to wear synthetics again, which I always really like because of the moisture management. Yeah. Yeah, really, my biggest problem with synthetics has always been odor control. And I just didn't like the feel because they kind of, uh, they cling to you, they can generate static electricity, yep. they just, I don't know, I, I like a natural fiber next to skin better than a synthetic. That's personal preference, I know Brad and I, I like disagree on that yeah. front. Um, but some of the real advantages... Like sweat more, no static electricity. <laughs> yeah. What's up? What some of the advantages of the pure synthetic option are number one, cost. Yeah, they're very Number expensive. two, durability. Yeah, and um, they wear like iron. I mean, yeah. you can, I've, I have some of the old pa Patagonia Capilines from way back. And the, the big negative, I think, I think the big negative has always been odor control, yeah. and we believe they've solved that with Polygene. Yeah, I've been incredibly happy with everything I have that has Polygene in it. I really mean, quick wicking, really quick drying yeah. is the other big advantage. I so. mean, even just kind of, there are some companies like Columbia, Mountain Harbor with their new Cool Q, and Patagonia's coming out with their running top. They're actually designing this stuff to hold more water for ultra runners. People who know they're going to be doing high exertion sports for a very long time that still want moisture management in the summers, but still want the garment to hold more water. So like the Cool Q has these little discs that soak up water and keep it wet. So while you're moving, it keeps that evaporative cooling process going longer. So it's it's a really kind of a neat time for I know, I've seen uh, trail runners and mountain runners soaking like sleeves in the creek. Same idea. Put it back yep. on so you get that evaporative cooling. Yep. Hey, let's move on, Brad. And then I've got a sheet here if we need to get into specific details okay. on mixes, etc. Um, but let's talk about the third category, which is the hybrid. And my favorite. Yeah, and my favorite too. And I would say if you've tried a hybrid solution before and weren't impressed with it, I'd ask you to kind of give it another look, and what? we'll explain why you might have had a negative experience. I think... Look at the tag, look at the ratios. That's yeah. what we're going to talk about in, in the beginning, when Marina was the hot thing, some of the uh, uh, brands out there introduced products that had like 12% merino and they were, what's that, 88% synthetic. So um, you'd have 12% of the garment that didn't stink and 88% And it, did. it didn't work, but they yeah. were just doing it to keep costs down and to be able to put merino, which was the buzzword in the market, yeah. on, the, on the hang tag. Um, 
Our favorite right now, and our favorite base layer is the Rab Miko stuff, which is 65% synthetic Merino. with, I'm sorry, 65% Merino, um, and it's a Australian source Merino, yep. and then it's 35% synthetic, and it's a Kakona treated polyester. Correct. Um, and gosh, the feel of this is amazing next to skin. Yeah, it feels like, it, well, 65% natural fiber, so it feels like you're wearing wool. But I guess the dry time of a synthetic. Yeah, that's a big thing. And the, and the wicking of merino. And the wicking of the synthetic. Yeah. The Kona treatment on it makes this wick really well. It dries really well. You've got odor control. You've got the next to skin feel that I like of a natural fiber. Cost is right in there with uh, you know where the market needs to be competitive. Yeah, I mean it's 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 definitely more than just a pure synthetic option, but it's far less than say a, a pure merino solution. And well, and this is the the Rab Miko stuff, and Miko stands for merino and Kakona. Mm -hmm. um, this is the only company I know of out there that is doing this type of solution with these type of, uh, this mixture of hybrid, that's 6535. This is a unique product to the market, and I think they may have cornered it, because I have found nothing else that works better. I and mean, I find myself grabbing my 120 weight and my 165 weights almost non-stop anymore. I have a whole drawer of base layers and stuff that never gets used anymore, because I, these are my go-to pieces every single time. And they did some great things with the stitching, putting the seam on the outside of the shirt. Uh, you know, they just... They knocked it out of the park in my opinion. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, so, yeah, Rab is really our favorite right now. Uh, anything else you want to add on this, Brad? The, the Kokona uh, is made from coconut husk carbon. So basically take a coconut, husk it, and then burn that. It produces the finest carbon, uh, basically just ash. Basically they're throwing in this uh, polyester. One gram of that uh, carbon has the same, has the same uh, surface area as a soccer field. So basically you can take that and say, okay, we're going to add all these little bits to that polyester, which increases the surface area, which increases the wicking and the dry time. Yeah, and, and the carbon has odor control built into it too, because it kind of neutralizes odors, which is really nice. Well, Kakona started off by being used as a treatment on pure synthetics. Yeah. And, you know, I think it worked. Um, I still didn't like the feel of the pure synthetic next to my skin, yeah. personally. No, this is just soft. And after a long day, like on a yurt trip or something like that, skiing, I really find this comfortable to be in. I used to bring just a dry wool layer to wear up there because I love the feeling of it mm -hmm. and take my synthetics off. They dry by the fire. Now I can stop bringing multiple sets of clothing. I can just bring this because I know it's going to dry. I can get it in my sleeping bag dry and it's still comfortable to be in at night. And we've sold a lot of this Miko stuff and I haven't had any uh, returns in terms of a durability issue. Or no, no, far less than Reno. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So that's the state of the market right now. Um, yeah, if you're interested in seeing more videos like this, let us know. We're going to keep uh, trying to uh, educate you with different types of videos yep. on different topics. And so yep. if you find something that you really like, please let us know. If you've got ideas for videos you know, that you would like to see us uh, dive into or a particular product you want us to review, um, let us know. If you've got questions, the Ask, Ask Brad, Brad stuff yep. over on our forums. Yep. If we didn't answer anything here, please just feel free to put those up there, and I'll be happy to answer them as fast as I can. And you'll see the Ask Brad link in our right-hand column on our website. So our website's prolightgear.com. You'll see it in the closing. Um, I think that's it for now. Yeah, yeah thanks for watching, yeah, thank and you. thanks for supporting us at uh, prolightgear.com.